All right, 2.2. We started 2.2 last time, and just as a real quick rundown, we have um, several new basic derivative rules. Um, the first one was that the constant's derivative is zero. The power rule is that the derivative of x to the n is n x to the n minus one. Constant multiplier says that if you have a constant multiplied by a function, then the constant just comes along for the ride, and then you take the derivative of the function. Sum and difference rules are wonderful. They just say that you take the sum or you take the derivative of each piece and then put the sum or the difference between them, however they were associated originally. And then the derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And we did a couple of real basic ones to start with last time, and it was a really good place for us actually to stop. Because what I want you to realize is that while there's some that are very basic, and that's great, there's others that require a little bit of manipulation in order to be able to use the rules that you now have. And this would be an example of one of those. So there's some places in your um, my math or not my math lab web assignment, excuse me, in your web assign where it will create a table kind of like this, um, and the same thing will happen in um, the written work as you're looking at um, some of the quiz practice questions. Um, and it's trying to get you used to the idea that sometimes it doesn't really look like one of those rules, but there's a way to rewrite them so that it will. Um, and then eventually, we're not going to have a table anymore. You're just going to start with 4 over 3x squared, and you're going to be expected to sort of fill in the missing pieces along the way. So this is guiding you down that idea. So um, obviously, the x squared kind of has a similar feeling to the x to the n rule that we have, right? But the x squared is in the denominator, not you know in the numerator where it sort of should be. So as we're thinking about rewriting this, we need to move that x squared to the numerator. Now, please don't move the 3. 3 and x squared, I know they're multiplied, but you can't move x squared and just move the 3 along with it. That's not correct. So the 3 is going to stay put. And if I move the x squared up, what will the exponent become? Negative 2. And you can simply write it out to the side like this. So 4 thirds is still the same fraction it always was, 4 in the numerator, 3 in the denominator, but now instead of the x squared in the denominator, I have an x to the negative 2. Technically, you could say in the numerator or multiplied next to it either way. Once it's in that form, we can actually use our basic derivative rules to solve it, so or to differentiate it. That 4 thirds at the beginning is a constant multiplier, so like I mentioned a moment ago, it comes along for the ride. And then we're going to take the derivative of x to the negative 2. So I mentioned when we encountered that x to the n rule that it works for positives and negatives, it works for fractions and decimals and radicals, it works for any kind of exponent. So it's totally fine that it have a negative 2 exponent. So I'll do the same thing that the rule says that I would do when I had that x to the 7th on Tuesday. I bring the exponent down in front, so it's a negative 2, and then I decrease my exponent by 1. So if I decrease my exponent by 1, what will that give me? Yeah, negative 3. Be real careful. It's sometimes tempting to make it a negative 1, um, as though we were subtracting from a positive or something, but we're not. So it's negative 3. And then this part over here that says simplify. So when you get to the derivative quiz, which is a week from today, you don't have to simplify. You could leave it right here and you'd be done. In fact, I would encourage you to leave it right there because it gives you less ability to more to make a mistake accidentally afterwards, right? But for what we're doing when we're actually working through homework problems and things like that, we want to finish the process. The derivative gateway simply just doesn't finish processes. I just want to know this particular component, how, can you, how well are you able to do that part of it. But we're simplifying. So what is simplifying means is we want the problem to look like it began. So in the original problem, the exponent was positive, right? So in the final answer, the exponent should also be positive. So when we're simplifying, it's not a matter of like sort of hitting certain criteria. It's a matter of making the problem's answer mirror the original problems that was given to you. Okay, the form's matching. So for this one, we would end up getting the negative 2 being multiplied by my 4. So this would be negative 8. 3 is still in the denominator, and now so is x cubed. And that would be what would be viewed as the simplified form because it matches the original form. Okay? 
So there's going to be some problems that are sort of leading you step by step through this where inside of WebAssign they're going to ask you to change it and they're going to ask you to differentiate and then they're going to ask you to simplify. So just go along with it. But eventually, you've done a few of those, the problems change to be looking more like number four. So number four doesn't say rewrite, but you have to rewrite because it doesn't actually match any of the other rules that we've already got. Does that make sense? So whether they tell you to rewrite or not, you may have to rewrite. In particular, the reason that this one um, can't work the way that it is is because you see division, right? You see a polynomial on top, polynomial on bottom, and they're divided, and there isn't, so far, that we've talked about, a rule for what to do when you have divided functions. There will be on Tuesday next week, okay? Or actually, maybe today. can't remember. No, I think it's today. We'll get to it in section 2.3. But for right now, and even when we get to 2.3, this one actually works really not well to be able to simplify from where it is and not use any more complicated derivative rules. So in particular, if you think about what you know about fractions, usually we think about fractions from the opposite perspective, where we have to get common denominators in order to make them a single fraction, right? So right now, it has a common denominator. The denominator for all of the pieces of the numerator is x squared. And I'm going to separate it out into three separate fractions. So I'm going to write x cubed over x squared. I'm going to write negative 3x squared over x squared and 4 over x squared. Three separate fractions. So we're a little bit more used to going the other direction. Three separate fractions mush them all together, right? It's true. And we're separating them back out. But the reason we are is because each of those pieces can be rewritten, kind of like I rewrote the last problem, in such a way that I'm able to use my basic derivative rules. So what is x cubed divided by x squared? Just x, right? What is 3x squared divided by x squared? Just the 3, and it's negative because I had a subtraction sign there. And then the last piece almost looks just like this one over here without the 3, right? 4 over x squared. So I can rewrite that as 4x to the negative 2. And it's important to realize that I've done no calculus. That's all algebra. It may be algebra that you sort of haven't thought about that way before, but it's algebra. Just manipulating the expression. The calculus step is the differentiation step. So all of that's the same thing. Now we're ready to do g prime of x. So what is the derivative of x? It's 1. Yeah, it's the coefficient of x. So the coefficient is an understood, right, like we don't actually see it written in there, but there's a, there's a 1 right here. What's the derivative of the negative 3 in the middle? Yeah, it's 0. You don't necessarily have to write it. I will just so that we can make sure that we see that I that it did it and it didn't just sort of skip over it. And then I need the derivative of 4x to the negative 2. Okay, so the negative 2 will come down and be multiplied by my 4. So I actually have negative 8x. And my new exponent is a negative 3. <clears throat> okay, so again, on your quiz next week, on, on Thursday, right, the derivative quiz, you can leave it like that. But for anything else that we're doing, you're going to simplify it. And again, simplifying means making it look like what it started with. So no negative exponents in particular on this one. So one version of simplifying this would simply be to move that x cubed back to the denominator. And I'm totally fine with you leaving it like this. Um, if you were working on one of your book problems and checking the back of the book, they might also get this to have a common denominator, right? They might. Um, and if they did, that would end up giving you, right, x cubed over x cubed minus 8 over x cubed, or they might have the version of this combined to be written as x cubed minus 8 over x cubed. It does not need to be done. I just want you to make sure that if you see that in the back of the book or if somebody else gives you that or you're using an online resource where it puts it in that form, that those two forms are actually both right. So this is fine or this is fine. Okay, so either of those would be the final version of this. Equally good. <coughs> is that all right? 
Any questions so far? Okay. This one's got radicals in it. Those are fun. Um, and I don't know about you, but those simple basic derivative rules, those first five rules that we started with today, did not have any radicals in them, right? So we definitely have to rewrite this in order to be able to use any of the rules that we already have. No radicals. So how am I going to rewrite this so that it's equal, right? It's the same thing, but it's in a different form. How can I rewrite cube root of x? Right, it's x to the one-third. And how can I rewrite fifth root of x? x to the one-fifth. And if it's been a while since you've seen rational exponents, here's the way it works. The mth root of x to the n is x to the n over m. So in our problem, the n is a power 1, because I just have x underneath the radical, no power visible on x, so it's an understood 1. So that's why I'm getting the 1 third and the 1 fifth. I'd also like to point out to you that there's nothing that's more simplified in either of these versions. Radicals and rational exponents are both valid ways of writing values that are, there's not like one that's preferable over the other one. There's really not. We see both of them and they're both fine. That said, when we get to the answer to this problem, our answer needs to be back in radical form because the problem started out in radical form. Does that make sense? So if our problem had started out with rational exponents, there'd be no reason at the end to sort of somehow turn them back into radicals. We're only going to do that because the problem started out in radicals, okay? So we have a version now that works very well to take a derivative of. So what is the derivative of x to the one-third? Good. All right, so sometimes subtracting fractions, we have to sort of pause, right, make sure we get that right. I need one-third minus one. It's not negative one-third, right? Common denominator, simplify the fractions and so forth. This would be negative two-thirds. How about the x to the one-fifth? What's that piece going to become? I'll start you out. One fifth. What's next? Yeah, x to the negative four fifths. So same thing. One fifth minus one. I get negative four fifths. Derivative gateway. Stop right there. Anything else? We need to turn it back into radical form because that's how it began. Okay, so <coughs> my exponents are negative. What does that tell me? Tanner, you're trying to tell me something. I can just tell. They go below. Exactly. So if they're in the numerator, they now shift to the denominator. So yeah, they're going to go into the denominator. So let me do an in-between step of that first. So this is 1 over 3x to the 2 thirds plus 1 over 5x to the 4 fifths. Okay, so that took care of the fact that the exponents were negative. Now I need to turn them into radical form. And it's still up here on the screen, right? This is the way that we turn them into radical form. So what will my x to the 2 thirds become? Okay, yeah, so not square root, but cube root. Yeah, it'll be cube root. So we've got a cube root, and then it's x squared. Do you notice how it started out as a cube root and it ends as a cube root? That always happens too, because of the way subtraction of fractions works, just so you know. The other piece also has a rational exponent of 4 fifths on this one. So what will x to the 4 fifths become? fifth root of x to the fourth. So my derivative looks like that in its final form on this one.
Any questions on the rational radical exponents? All right. So we're going to take um, the directions and change them up just a bit. So remember, there's three phrases now that all mean the same thing. When you see the phrase, find the slope, that was supposed to highlight, let's try again, find the slope. What does find the slope mean? It's the same as derivative. So find the slope, so the slope of the tangent line specifically, or the slope of the curve, or derivative. They all mean the same thing. I'm finding a derivative. And then it says um, to use the derivative and the graphing feature to confirm your results. So we're going to do some graphing stuff at the end of the problem that's going to be a little bit different. The other thing that happens on this one is you'll notice that they give you a particular point, right? Didn't have that over here. So if I'd had that over here, what it would mean is that after I did what I already did, I would evaluate this at x equals, in this case, 2. So I would plug in 2 for x, and I'd simplify to get a value. Okay, so that's what's going on with our values. So you guys are going to like this one. What's the derivative of 3x cubed? That's right, 9x squared. And then the derivative of the negative 10? That's 0. So I actually just have 9x squared. So, go, so far so good, right? It's way a lot easier than the last two I just did. But we have this extra condition at the end that wants us to find it at the point 214. Now, I realize that 214 has an x and a y pair. The x value is the only value of it that's needed for this particular problem. All right, It is at the point 214. Like if you looked at it on the graph, at x equals 2, y is 14. That's fine. But I don't need the 14 for this particular problem. So I'm going to evaluate this at x equals 2. So if I plug this in, my slope, I'll just use m for now, is 9 times 2 squared. Please remember, that's the 2 that's being squared. Don't multiply your 9 and 2 first, order of operations, right? 2 squared is 4, and 4 times 9 is 36. Okay, so grab your calculator. I'm going to remind you, we've only done it once. There's this cool feature, remember, called inderiv in your calculator. So if you will press math 8... And if you do, it pulls up inderiv. Or it will look like, oops, inderiv like that. Or it will look like d, d, and it's got these blank boxes. And a blank here, and then a blank, and a blank. Okay, so one of these two things happens. If you've got the inderiv like mine does, you're going to tell it y1 comma x, comma 2. And remember, we get y1 underneath bars. You select y bars, function, and y1. If yours pulled up this newer with the DD, you know, DDs, everything, all that in there, you're going to put an x right here. You're going to put y1 here. You're going to put an x right here. And you're going to put a 2 right there. I need to make that a little bit bigger next time. Sorry about that. Is the y1 going to be our original? Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mention that. I should have. Yes, the y1 is your original equation. So you're going to put this equation into y1. So your y1 is going to say 3x cubed minus 10. So plug that into y1. That's actually where I should have began. I'm sorry about that. And then these steps here at the bottom. And you should get an answer of 36 if we've done everything correctly, both technology-wise and, you know, by hand-wise. Did anybody get 36? Oh, good. Reed did, and I'm working on names. Matthew, is that right? Matthew did. Did anybody not get a 36? Justin, you did too. Good. Okay, did anybody's not work? Okay, so this is really cool. Your calculator can't check this problem. Not directly. I mean, it can't. But it can check this problem because you're evaluating it. Okay, second problem, same direction. So we're going to try this process again. So we've got f of theta. Theta is my variable now. 
So, and we've got it at the point zero, zero. So we're going to do f prime of theta. So what's the derivative of 4 sine theta? What's the derivative of sine? Cosine. Good. So this would be 4 cosine theta, right? You remember, now theta is just like x. So what's the derivative of just the negative theta at the end? Negative 1. Right. Okay, so it's a coefficient of 1 as understood here. That's why they're getting the 1 at the end. And then we're evaluating at this at the point 0. So we're doing f prime of 0. So if you grab your calculator or if you remember your unit circle, does so anyone know what the cosine of 0 is? It's 1. So I have 4 times 1 minus 1, which gives me 3. Thank you. 3. And we're going to confirm it with calculator. So in y1, plug the original equation in, right? And you can, you can plug it in as x's, right? So in y1, there's no reason to change variables. You're going to type in 4 sine of x, yeah, and then minus x, okay? That's what's going to be in y1. And then you're going to go through the same thing, math 8, which gives you n derivative and whichever version of the calculator you have, evaluating it at x equals 0, do you get 3? Somebody give me a thumbs up if yours works out to being 3. Tanner says, good. Okay, we've got Zach. Yep, good. Zero. Um, and that's coming from right here. So x is zero at the end. Yes. Okay, if anybody's not, if it doesn't work out, I want to know so I can double check your calculator because I don't want your calculator to be causing you concerns. Yours is not, Miguel? Right. Maybe I should make mention of it because it sometimes will happen. Hers actually says two point. It's got a bunch of nines and then a three, three, three on the end. Um, what you have to understand is that your calculator doesn't use calculus. Your calculator uses those numerical tables, like numerical estimates, to calculate all of its things. So there are sometimes actually rounding rule errors where you did the problem right and your calculator actually didn't find the exact correct answer. So you have to be smarter in your calculator to know that that's still okay. So yeah, it three is, three is what it's actually telling you even when it doesn't actually say three. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, I wanna shift a little bit again on my directions. So we have found general derivatives, right? We found derivatives, then evaluated them at a point, and now we're gonna actually find tangent lines. So we're going to find an equation of a tangent line to the graph of f at the given point. And then again, we're going to use our calculator to confirm that it makes sense, that it seems reasonably correct. So this is, again, a very nice function. And we did this last time, these same directions, but in section 2.1. And we talked about the fact that one of the versions that's maybe the nicest to work with here, it's not the only one, would be y equal mx plus v. Um, and that would be one of our versions of our line. Or if you want, you can use y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. That's the point slope form of the line. Maybe we didn't talk about that last time, but maybe we'll use that one this time just as a variety so you can see it. So we need a line, which means we're going to use one of these two versions of the line in order to create the equation we're looking for at the very end of the problem. But no matter which of these two versions you want to use, ah, hang on, they have m in them, yep. And so I actually have to find m the slope. And the slope is found by finding the derivative. Because slope of a tangent line, slope of a curve, and derivative are all the same thing. So we're going to find the derivative of x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 2. So what is the derivative of x to the fourth? 4x four cubed. Mm -hmm. What's the derivative of 3x squared? 
6x. You guys don't want to talk to me today. Subtraction sign. And then what's the derivative of the 2 at the end? 0, yeah. So I'm not going to write it. I think we're OK at this point with recognizing the constants. So this is my derivative. And this is the x value location where I'm trying to interpret it at, 2. So that's what I'm going to let x equal. So over here, this is being evaluated at x equal to 2. So my slope is 4 times 2 cubed minus 6 times 2. All right, so somebody tell me what that works out to be. 24? Hmm? I have 20 written down, but I could be wrong. Sometimes my notes have errors. Is it 20? Yeah? Okay. So we have 20. 32 minus 12, yes, should be 20. So we have 20. So my slope is 20. Um, if I use the point slope form of the line, it's actually pretty nice on this one. So y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So the y1 value is actually the second part of my ordered pair. It's 6. The slope I just found is 20. And then the x1 value is 2. And I can simplify this with just a little bit of algebra. So y minus 6 equals 20x minus 40. And if I add my 6, y is going to equal 20x minus 34. Is everybody all right with that? Okay, so what does it mean here to use the graphing utility to confirm? Because I'm not just confirming a slope, right? I'm not just finding out, did it give me 20? I need to know, do I get an equation that's 20x minus 34, and is that reasonable? So what you're going to do when you confirm with the calculator here is you're going to put the equation into y1, just like we would have with the other one. And you're going to put your derivative, uh, or not your derivative, your tangent equation into y2. Um, and you need to be able to be seeing the point at 2, 6. So your standard 10 by 10 window should work just fine. So you can make it, you can hit zoom standard, that's zoom 6. That's your easiest way to get there. And what you're looking for is you're looking for a graph where it seems reasonable that, in fact, I have a tangent line touching my graph, and it's not some other kind of random line being drawn. I don't have my graph drawn on this one, so let me just see what that looks like. Okay, so the original graph is a W shape, is that right? Mine looks like a W. So the original graph looks something like... Is that showing up on yours like that? And then I also have on the graph, I'll do a different color. Some of you actually have yours different colors. Mine doesn't do that. Something that looks like this on the side. Does it seem reasonable that I have a tangent line drawn there? Yeah. Now let's just say that you graphed this, your answer, and your answer looks something like this. Then you'd know you have a problem, right? Or let's say your answer looked like this. Again, you should know you have a problem. Those don't look like tangent lines. Tangent lines have to be a line that touches but doesn't cut through, at least nearby the point 26. So in fact, my original line looked pretty good like that. Okay, we have one more question. Again, directions changing again. Um, in particular, last time we talked about places where tangent lines didn't exist. Um, or actually, what we talked about is places where derivatives didn't exist. Um, and the places where the derivatives didn't exist had some certain features. It talked about sharp curves and things like that, right? And we talk about vertical tangent lines. What happens when there's a vertical tangent line? So now this problem is asking about horizontal tangent lines. And horizontal, of course, is like the horizon. So we're looking at a flat line like this, OK? So on a graph, 
when we're trying to find a place where we have a horizontal tangent line, what can you tell me about the slope of this line? It's zero. Okay, so you remember that? Horizontal line has zero slope. Vertical lines have an undefined slope. So what I'm actually being asked for when it says, find out where you got a horizontal tangent line, is they're, they're actually asking me, where do I have a slope of zero? Well, we know how to find slope. It's a derivative. So I find the place where I have a derivative, and I figure out where that's equal to zero. So we need a derivative of the equation that we have. Now, this one does have fractions in it, but notice that the x, the powers of x, are not in the denominator, so it makes it actually kind of nicer. Um, I have the 2 thirds, and then I would be working with the x cubed. So what's the derivative of x cubed? Mm -hmm. 3x squared. And then I have my 1 half. What's the derivative of x squared? How about 2x? Um, what's the derivative of negative 3x? Negative 3, and the derivative of 27? 0. Um, we'll take just a quick minute to clean this up. Um, you'll notice that the 3's cancel here and the 2's cancel there. So this is actually 2x squared minus x minus 3. And the directions say that I want this to equal 0, right? I want my slope to be 0. And that starts to look like an algebra problem. How do I find where a quadratic is equal to 0? Well, if I can, I'd factor it. And if I can't, I might use a quadratic formula. So we'll see if it factors. Does this factor? What does it factor into? I'm getting some numb heads. So you said 2x and x. Negative 3 and positive 1. Does that work? Okay. If you're rusty on your factoring, that's okay, but it might be time to brush up on it. Of course, we set each of those equal to 0, so I have 2x minus 3 equals 0. If I add the 3 and divide by 2, this is x is 3 halves. And then x plus 1 is 0, so x is negative 1. So there are actually two locations where I have slopes that are 0. That's what this says. But I haven't quite answered the question because it says determine the points. And I just found the x-coordinates of the points. Are you with me? So... I found the x values, 3 halves and negative 1, and I need to find the corresponding y values. And these come from the original equation, right? These y values I'm looking for have to come from the original equation up here. So let's let our calculator do the hard work. Does that sound good to you? All right. So over here in y equals, put your original equation in. It's a little bit messy. So you have 2x cubed over 3 minus x squared over 2 minus 3x and plus 27. Um, over in your table, what you'll find when you put these in is that they end up being really ugly values. So like 3 halves is the nicer of the two. I actually get a terminating decimal. It's 23.625. And that's OK. Um, the next one's not quite so OK. If I put in negative 1, I actually get a repeating decimal. So I'm going to show you how you can change this differently so that I don't end up with these weird values, at least in the sense of it being repeating decimals showing up. This is 28. 0.83 in the three repeats. So let me show you how you can actually get the fractional versions of that um, in a different op option. So to go to the regular screen on your calculator, absolute regular screen, 
okay? The one where you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually pull up y1. You all know how to do that because we've gone through it with the end derivative stuff before. So do vars, y vars, function y1. So there should be just a y1 on your screen now. All right, so right now all your calculator says is y1. And then I'm going to have you put in parentheses and put that 3 over 2 next to it. So it's using kind of function notation, and when you hit enter, it gives you probably, unless your calculator's version, or not version, but the... Uh, um, details are set up a little bit differently than mode, it probably tells you the 23.625 still, okay? If you hit math, the very first option on the very first line, number one, says frac. Do you see that? Press enter, and then press enter again, and it will turn your decimal into a fraction. And mine says 189 over 8. <coughs> Now, that one is the one that if you plugged it into WebAssign, it would take either the decimal or the fraction. And the reason it would is because the decimal terminates. The other one, your WebAssign is going to make you round something. It's not going to let you put in a repeating bar on top of a 3. There's just not an option for that. So it's not going to be an acceptable answer. So you have to enter something that looks different. So again, if you hit vars, y vars, function y1, and you plug in negative 1, it's still going to give you the 28.83 with the 3 repeating, like it's what's going to say on the calculator, but you can tell it to do a fraction by hitting math, frac, enter, and it will turn into 173 over 6. And WebAssign would absolutely expect to see that. It's not going to give you credit for a rounded answer if you use the repeating decimal form. Of course, unless it says to round or something like that. Okay. Any questions on that? Um, if you're struggling with any of the technology stuff, because I know I can't really display everything that I'd love to be able to display simultaneously, it doesn't work very well. Um, the Success Center is great at using the calculators. My office hours are always open to you, of course, to come in and double check your operations of your calculator for us to make sure you're on the right track there.